Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are here in our midst. We ask, so, Father, that you continue to reveal yourself to us. And Father, most of all, we want to hear your voice. Oh Lord, it's terrible not to hear your voice, not to be led by your Spirit. It's no different than being lost out in the world and not having no relationship with you. Father, we are your sheep, and you say that your sheep hear your voice. Help us to discern your voice, speaking to us in various manners. We ask, O God, that you cause us to be attuned to you. And we ask, O Lord, that even right now, that your Spirit will come upon each one of our hearts and minds. And let an understanding flow forth. Let the scales drop from our eyes. And let the, the things that block us from hearing you drop off. That we may hear your voice in your voice alone. And cause us to know, Lord, as we leave this place today, that we have heard and we have understood how to hear your voice. And Father, for all that you do, we give you the glory, the worship, and the honor. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Praise God. We are on a series on the voice of God. And last week we talked about the voice of God in creation. How God speaks to us in creation. And uh, today we want to look at God speaking to us through circumstances. We touched a little bit on that the last week in God in creation. We're going to look at God speaking in circumstances. So is it possible for God to speak to us through circumstances? Yes, but there are laws about how God does that. Because circumstances sometimes can be forced. So we are not dependent. Remember as we cover this series, we are not dependent on circumstances. The most important voice you hear is is the inner voice of the Spirit within you. However, we need to consider all that is around the creation and circumstances and how God operates through those things. Because circumstances can sometimes confirm what God is speaking to our lives. Circumstances sometimes can be a challenge to to what God wants us to do. So we need to learn how to handle circumstances. There's a famous story in the book of Judges called Gideon's Fleece. It speaks about a man named Gideon and who wants, wants confirmation on what God is speaking to him about leading the Israelites. So Gideon prayed a prayer and put a fleece out. And uh, he told the Lord, Lord, uh, if uh, it is um, uh, uh, dry, or, uh, dry and then everything is wet around, that I'll take it that's you. And uh, something that was physically impossible. And then when God did that, he was not satisfied. He said, do it the other way around. And the other, t- the other way around happens. And uh, it's known as Gideon's Fleece. And sometimes Christians uh, try to use that, especially today, uh, uh, when they want to be led by the Spirit. And there is in the New Testament, what, what before the Holy Spirit came down, when they cast lots to choose two of the, uh, one of the, among two people, one of them to replace Judas Iscariot, who betrayed Jesus, to join the twelve. And we are told about the story of the casting of lots. Now, doesn't the casting of lots sound a bit like chance? It does. Uh, that story, by the way, is found in the book of Acts chapter 1. And uh, so, if chance is involved, then circumstances are involved, correct? Because how would you know when you cast a lot, which lot will fall on who? So, there's chance involved, but notice this, it never happened again after the Holy Spirit came. The only way the people were led after the Holy Spirit came was by hearing the voice of the Spirit. So that's the New Testament pattern. However, in the Old Testament, they do use a lot of casting of lots many times. And remember how one time they want to isolate uh, the fam- the, uh, certain individuals uh, as to uh, who has partaken of the honey when there was an oath that Saul uh, pronounced rashly uh, that no one should eat until he conquered his enemy. And then it came down to Jonathan by the casting of lords. What we can tell is, is there's an Old Testament pattern and there's a New Testament pattern in God speaking to His people. In the New Testament, God speaks primarily through the Holy Spirit. But as we all know, 
a lot of the Old Testament things still get carried through. What we have in the New is we have everything in the Old plus more. That means that God still can speak through circumstances. However, circumstances are no more the final word. It used to be the final word in, in, before the Holy Spirit came. But when the Holy Spirit came, it's not the final word, but it's one of the ways that God still uses. The final word has to come from our inside. And we will cover uh, these areas as we go along in this series. But we need, must not neglect that God does work in circumstances. He still does today. He's the same God. And so we need to look at some of the laws governing circumstances. Now, circumstances to us looks like a hap- uh, no, happenstance. Things that just happen. I, I say uh, the, uh, the, the ball bounces whichever way it wants. But we saw last week the ball bouncing on the floor. When you throw, uh, when you throw a ball down on the floor, uh, it bounces. <laughs> we do have a ball. Thank you very much. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> and uh, thank you very much. So, it says... Uh, you know, that we do not know which way the ball bounces, but there are laws that govern how the ball bounces. It's not an accident. If an accident, no one can play tennis. No one can play anything that has a ball. The ball bounces or goes in a certain direction based on the direction in which it is pushed, the uh, ground on which it bounces, how hard, how soft, the material of the ball, the temperature, plus gravity. It will bounce differently in sub, sub-zero gravity. And uh, so we realize that it's not just chance. Now, because we are so tiny as an individual in the whole scheme of God's creation, we sometimes think that all that has happened is by chance. It is not. And there are two little laws that are involved in circumstances that I want to mention. Every action, every imagination produces a cycle of activity. It causes an action and a reaction. Every circumstance, every action and every imagination. I use the word imagination carefully and I'll explain that later. Not only do our actions produce it, but there is a rank of our imagination that produces a certain cycle of activity. When someone is obsessed with some things for some time, it will produce some reaction in themselves and in others. So, like for example, you know, if I push this chair, there is an action, there is a reaction. But what the action and reaction is, is immediate. There's an immediate action and reaction. Now some actions do not have immediate reaction. They take time. So the first law in understanding how God speaks of circumstances to understand is every action and every imagination. And you can put the word imagination with the Hebrew word for imagination, which is the word yetzer. Y-E-T-Z-E-R. And we have a whole series on that. Yetzer. Every action and every yetzer or imagination produces a cycle. A cycle of, of, of uh, action and reaction. It, it does something. And whoever is caught in that cycle will experience it. For example, if you go, to, uh, if you go into a swimming pool and the swimming pool is calm, you have one person jumping, it produces... There's a uh, uh, splashing in the water and waves. Another person jumps in. Now, is a is a, a big enough guy jumps in on the other end of the pool, it will cause a big wave to come your way. All right. You are suffering the, the reaction and the cycle produced by that guy who jumps in just now. And if it's a pool deep enough where they do a lot of diving, the higher the person jumps from, the greater the splash is. I mean, if they, if they splash and if they, uh, uh, and call it the big splash. And if that person is sizable enough, about three times the size of, of my dog, Mosette, 
he will make a big splash. And, uh, and you wouldn't want to be about two meters away from where he splash. So his action causes a reaction and you got the consequences of it. Every action or yet, sir, produces a cycle of circumstances to flow. Now, the second law involved is every cycle has a beginning and an end. It has a beginning and an end. It should logically end. But because the action produces a reaction, it continues. So, if, if for example, I throw this ball on the ground, uh, if the ground is soft and mushy, like mud, the ball will just get in and stuck, and my action, it absorbs all of the action of my ball. It doesn't come out anymore. But because the ball is hard, it reacts to the ball, and it, the, the ball actually is squashed, and it actually bounces off. So action produces a reaction. I see? That produces a reaction. Right. Now, if Stephen doesn't react, right, he will get a knock you on his head. Right? <laughs> so, it produces a reaction. Now, because he reacts, the ball ended up here and not there. So, every, every, every cycle has a beginning and an end. Now, at the ending part, if there's a reaction, it continues to cycle. Now, that speaks about things in every area. For example, uh, when people think about overcoming the devil or trying to do some, uh, something to overcome evil, you can never overcome evil with evil. Because if someone is evil and you do all the unlawful things to get rid of that guy and you succeed, you have become a greater evil. For you have used a greater illegal force to overcome this guy. You have become the greater illegality. So the only way to overcome evil is to overcome it with good. Because when good overcomes evil, only goodness prevails. Which is why when when one nation wants to fight against another nation, a, a nation can use all the illegal methods. For example, the police want to capture the criminal. The police are limited by the law. The police cannot... I mean, generally, they cannot. They are not supposed to. Right? I know being human, sometimes in an imperfect society, sometimes even the law, uh, the, the, the law keepers are not law-abiding. But, strictly speaking, the law enforcers are supposed to capture the criminals using lawful methods. Reasonable force too. And lawful methods. And... If they do it lawfully, good overcomes evil. But if they use illegal means, they themselves have become a greater evil. And so it depends on how the reaction is that the set of circumstances begin. Now let's look at some of the things in the Bible. All of us, when we, are, we come onto this earth, which at whichever point we come into this life, we already suffer consequences of all that has gone before us. All of society, all of creation. For example, straight away, we already suffer the consequences of Adam's sin. You enter into a cycle of a chain of events. Some things have a long cycle. Let's look at the book of uh, Second Samuel. Second Samuel. passage that we look at the last uh, week, 2 Samuel chapter 21, in uh, <clears throat> verse 1, it says, Now there was a famine in the days of David. Now this is what David, who was a good king, experienced for three years, year after year. And David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is because of Saul and his bloodthirsty house, because he killed the Gibeonites. Now at that time Saul has already died. Many years have passed by. This is 2 Samuel chapter 21. Many years into David's reign. And yet, he experienced nearly a few decades ago, the action and reaction that is caused by Saul. 
King Saul did something in his reign that was bad, that was illegal, that David was now suffering the consequences. Can you see that? Was it fair? Many times you and I would say, not fair. But look, fairness and justice some has to be looked at an objective level, not a subjective level. Because some things that we say is not fair, but when you look at the overall plan, there is an action and reaction in you right there. In the midst of that, there is the whole justice system that is still working. Because Saul did something, if there is no reaction, then all the laws that God has made are not functioning. For good or for evil, the action of his produced evil. If he did many good things, David would have reaped it. So David here was suffering the consequences or the circumstances of a famine caused by Saul. And he took action in order to remove it. Now that was an Old Testament way of doing it. In the New Testament, that those things won't be done again. But he did something that cancelled those things. That is an example of a cycle that has taken over several decades. Some action and reaction is immediate. But some actions and reactions is measured in decades. Decades. And because our human lifespan is not really that long, if some action and reaction in war 50 year cycle or 100 year cycle, we may not even realize it. We might not even realize that it's tied to those things. Because it's hard to trace in one lifetime. Then there's another area which looks strange here in chapter 24, 2 Samuel. Here David was the one who did the wrong thing. He numbered the Israelites and he angered and God was upset at him. So there was a judgment that was taking place because of David's action and uh, David's wrong action. And in the end, David fell at the mercy of God, fasted and prayed. And uh, in verse 15, let's look at verse 15. The Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time. From then to Bathsheba, 70,000 men of the people died. Now that was almost an instant thing that took place. David disobeyed God in his pride. And everyone suffered the consequences. You also see a certain pattern emerge. The higher you are in influence, your one little action can cause the lives of many down the down the authority. Isn't that terrible? Right. But that's true. Any decision or reaction by one who is above us in influence and authority affects everyone down the line. I mean, for example, if, uh, if, uh, for example, uh, suddenly uh, the leader of the nation says, let's go and attack Indonesia, suddenly all of us are affected, right? Just one decision. Of course, he won't do that. But uh, just an illustration of how everything can change because of one decision. So the higher you are influenced, your action and reaction goes further too. And uh, David's David's wrong error cost 70,000 lives. That's a lot of people. 70,000 people died. But when, when David acknowledged his sin, and uh, in verse 18, Gad came that day to David and said, Go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Araunah, the Jebusite. At the very place where the plague was stopped, when David begged for God's mercy and forgiveness, and he acknowledged his sin, at the very place, God says, build an altar. And here is the interesting thing, at the very place where the plague was stopped, it happened, it happened, happened stands again, it happened to be the same place where Abraham offered his son Isaac, Amar Moriah, and it's the very place where God chose to build a temple. And it's the very place today which you call the temple site in Jerusalem. It was the exact geographical spot. Question, 
Was that a coincidence? With God, there is no coincidence. Second question. If David did not fall into sin or error, would that place have been revealed? We can only say yes because it seems to be the right answer. Because God cannot be using the wrong things to reveal the right things. So yes, I'm sure God would still reveal the place to build a temple. But then the third question comes. Why did God use that situation to reveal it? Why not he just leave that aside? Why was David at the right place at the right time doing the right thing? When just before he was at the right place doing the wrong thing in the wrong time. Now he's at the right place doing the right thing at the right time. And God says, that's the place I want to build a temple. So our third question stands. Why our God uses the circumstances of our life, even the circumstances of our failure, to reveal some of His plans? And He does. He uses them. Incorporates them into His divine revelation of speaking to our lives. Now that second story of David is this. It's just to let us know that God is in control of many things far more than we realize. We sometimes think God is small. We don't realize how powerful or how omniscient He is. That He has the ability to even see our mistakes before we do it and incorporate a plan that involves our mistakes. And through those things, reveal something beautiful. God is much bigger than that. Now, out of those things, I bring you to this conclusion that God does speak through our circumstances, quote-unquote, good or bad, some things are going to come forth out there. If you remember the law that nothing is by accident. There are no accidents in God. Everything has a cause and an effect. There is no such thing as an accident in God. Everything has a cause and effect. In Proverbs 26 verse 2 it says, Like a fleeting sparrow, like a flying swallow, so a curse without cause shall not alight. In other words, in some translation it says in verse 2, The curse causeless shall not come. Everything good or bad is caused from something before. If that is so, we are going to find out what all the different causes are that control the circumstances so that we can discern how God speaks to us. Now, as we show you the two laws of all the things that govern circumstances that fall, one is every action and every imagination causes a cycle. And second law, every cycle has a beginning and an end. Sometimes there's a nice end, sometimes there's a reaction to the ending and it produces a second cycle. Which is why the old movie stories of, of uh, the Avenger would never end, you know why? Because somebody kills somebody, the other guy takes revenge. The other guy takes revenge, kills this guy, and this guy uh, takes revenge, kills the other guy. The other guy kills the other guy. And so for generations, it's bounced to and fro. Action and reaction, no ending. Until, in the end, one of the family says, alright. I'll forgive that person who killed so and so. And so forgiveness comes and the cycle ends. So only when good and mercy comes can the cycle of evil stops. There are four different things that would affect circumstances. The first is in the area of Yetzer of vision. Turn with me in the book of Genesis. The book of Genesis, and we look at a very, uh, I would say, uh, interesting story of Jacob. Now, Jacob was a man who looks like circumstances keep on uh, occurring to him. He seems to be a man of circumstances. 
Because of uh, action and reaction, he ran away from his home. And he landed up in his uncle's place, Uncle Laban. In chapter 31 of Genesis, he served Uncle Laban. And he was tricked, married the wrong person. And uh, then he worked on for another seven years. In the end, he worked 14 years. 14 years he worked for the two daughters of Laban. Six years he worked for the flock. But the circumstances were not enough to bring him the blessing that God wanted to bring him. So the Bible tells us that when it was time for him to work for his wages, he wanted all the cattle that were spotted and speckled. So Laban took away, and he cheated actually, he quickly took away all the cattle that were spotted and speckled away to a distance, three days distance, and he left all the good cattle and sheep with Jacob. So Jacob looks and there was nothing that belonged to him. But an angel of the Lord taught him how to produce spotted and speckled cattle and sheep. In chapter 31, it tells us here, that uh, <clears throat> it says here, uh, verse 10, It happened at a time when the flocks conceived that I lifted my eyes and saw in a dream, and behold, the rams which lapped upon the flocks were streaked, speckled, and gray spotted. Angel of the Lord spoke in a dream, said, Jacob, he says, here I am. Here I am. Lift up your eyes now, all the rams which lift on the flocks are streaked, speckled, grey spotted, for I've seen all that Laban is doing to you. Now, how that took place besides him seeing it in a dream, is found in uh, chapter 30, where in verse 37, Jacob, through the revelation of God, took for himself green poplar, almond, chestnut trees, peeled white strips in them, exposed the white which was in the rods, and he put the rods in front of the animals as they drank water and as they made. He puts it in front so the animals, the animals see these things before the eyes. They see white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, white, black, and lo and behold, they give birth white, black, white, black. Spotter and speckle. Now, this is in the Bible, so we cannot deny that it took place. Unless you don't believe in the Bible. So, this actually took place and it actually worked. So far, I have known of no farmer who, who has tested this, right? It would be interesting to test. Being a scientist, I love to test all these things. But so far, I haven't got, got any sheep or cattle to test it on. But it would be good to test these things. <laughs> But we can accept that since it's in the Bible, it occurred and it took place and the sheep all gave black, white, black, white. Question, why did it take place? It has something to do in the realm, something powerful that controls every event and all circumstances. And that is the area of vision. Even a sheep has an inner part of them that control what is to come. That changes, quote unquote, if, can I be scientific about it? Scientifically, if the sheep produce spotted and speckled, the DNA must have changed, correct? Logically. Since we know today that the color of the sheep, the fur, the size, the eyes, is all controlled by the DNA of the sheep. So, as long as the DNA says, produce spotted, the sheep will keep producing spotted. Now, before that, the sheep was white. So, we can say that somehow there is a visual part of the sheep that when you see spotted, speckled, spotted, speckled, spotted, speckled, it somehow caused a change in the DNA and it produced spotted and speckled. It may sound too far-fetched for you, but let me remind you that it is scientifically documented that your diet can affect your DNA for the next generation. Your diet and your mental, emotional uh, constant, that means if you maintain that emotional state for a certain level, and your emotional state produces chemicals and hormones in your body, and it is constantly applied, that means for generation after generation, 
or even within your generation, but for a long time, it produces chemical changes in your body, which can indirectly affect your DNA in your body for the next generation. So if that is so chemically, we need to accept that there is a possibility of a DNA change because of some area called the visual element in an animal. If they are in an animal, are they in man too? Yes, the Bible says in the book of Genesis chapter 6, when God pronounced judgment upon all of mankind, He judged them based on their action and their imagination. I could understand it if God judged them based on their action. But God was judging them based on an element called the yetzer or the imagination. Look over at the book of Genesis chapter 6. It says here in verse 5, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every yetzer or intent of the heart, some translation put imagination, or every intent or imagination, the thought of his heart was only evil continually. Now he saw what was about to take place. Something was locked inside the imagination of man. I call it the spiritual DNA. Now, the Bible says, I read it last week, that everything in the spiritual causes what is in the natural. You can have three scriptures for that. Romans chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter uh, 4 and chapter 3, and also uh, Hebrews chapter uh, 11. It tells us that the worlds were framed by the word of God. And Corinthians, it tells us that the, the visible is made by the invisible. Romans 1 tells us that everything that you see is made by the pattern from the spiritual realm to show the attributes of God. In other words, everything in the natural has a pattern in the spiritual. Correct. So if in the natural, we have such a thing as DNA, there is such a thing as a realm in the spiritual, a spiritual DNA, which is the source of all things spiritual inside man. The spirit of man. So that is the yetzer part, or the imagination part. Now, here's a strange story in the book of Deuteronomy. Turn to Deuteronomy here. And uh, in Deuteronomy, chapter 31, God is speaking to good people. It was a new generation, remember, not an old generation. And in this new generation of people that he spoke to, and they were about to enter the promised land, they have not done anything wrong yet. And uh, up to that time, everyone was an obedient generation. The old generation had already passed away, and uh, this was a new generation. And it tells us here that Moses predicted that some things will happen in their generation. He says in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 21, now remember, this whole generation is a good generation. The old generation have all died. Except for Caleb and Joshua. And they were about to enter the promised land. And here was Moses giving them the last few sermons before they go in. And he said in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 21, Then it shall be, when many evils and troubles have come upon them, that this song will testify against them as a witness. Now what did the Lord say? The Lord said there will be troubles and evil that come upon them. Now that is circumstances, correct? But every circumstances and every evil, good, everything good and everything bad has a cause and an effect. Remember what I said. We are tracing where it starts, the source of it. Before they even enter the promised land, God says, these are the troubles that are going to come. And on what basis does God say it? Where is the source and the cause of it? Remember, they haven't even done wrong yet. Can you see that? They haven't even done the wrong thing yet. But the Lord saw in their yet, sir. In their spiritual or soul DNA. Something that will produce a wrong seed. 
And this is what he says in verse 21. He says, he, he, he got Moses to prepare a song to show them. And he says, I will test it, for it will not be forgotten in the mouths of their descendants. For I know the inclination of their behavior today. They have not done one, one bad thing yet. And God says, I know what they are going to do. The word inclination is the word yet, sir. Translated imagination in Genesis 6. For I know what is in their imagination. I know what is in their vision. And that it will produce those things. So even though they were good, there was still an inherent part of evil to be dealt with. Why does God re- dealt it that way? Now, in our other sermons on Yetzer, which you can take down but we won't turn to the Azar 29.16 and Azar 26 verse 3, God re- the word thing, T-H-I-N-G, the thing that is made, the word thing is the word Yetzer. So the word Yetzer in Hebrew, Y-E-T-Z-E-R, is translated as imagination, inclination and thing. Now, when God regards something as a thing, to God it is real. Radio waves are around us now, but you cannot touch it, correct? Is it real? Yes. But your five senses cannot grab a radio wave. It's invisible, but it's real. There are some things that are invisible, but they are real. To God, the yetzer or the vision inside, that is locked inside, is a thing. It's a seed that will produce. So the first cause of circumstances is what I call the vision or the imagination. And that is where sometimes we deceive ourselves in thinking we have it, but we don't. Just like Peter who says, Oh Lord, I won't betray you. But in the end, he denied Jesus. Three times, in fact. He even boasted that, that he will die with him. Because he know not what he said. Now, let's look at the concept of faith. Faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Faith is believing in God's word, correct? Faith says, God says it, I believe it, that settles it. And you can also make it stronger and say, God says it, it's settled. Now, how come a lot of times people say, I believe, I believe, and they are confident, they have joy, and yet the faith doesn't seem to work? Because there is an intricate process between it actually coming into our hearts. Coming into our hearts before everything is together on our inside. Because faith, despite all that we understand, is still a mystery in some area. The Holy Spirit and the laws of the Spirit, despite all we understand, is still a mystery. There is still a mysterious part of how it actually takes place. And visualizing, you can teach all the laws on visualizing. And we thought that we have visualized. You close your eyes and you visualize. But yet, you have visualized with your mind and it hasn't entered your yetza yet. Say, so how do I know when it's entered the yetza? The circumstances will be affected. Before that, it's still a hit and miss. So sometimes when we think that we have faith and it's presumption. That's why the Bible says have an abundance of the word because you do not know at which point that takes place. Now, to understand this point, I've got to go to the second point very quickly. Then I, I trace back because the two are related. Let me show an example here. The second cause of circumstances being affected, things to come, besides the first vision, is the second, the spoken word. Spoken word. Now, not every time you speak some word, it's going to affect. But there are some times when everything and all the everything is just in line and is released for. Let me give you an example. In the book of Genesis, here is in Jacob's life too. 
Jacob had ran away from Laban, and Laban was running after Jacob, and he was upset because somebody stole his idols. And of all the people who stole his idols, it was Rachel who stole the idols. And so when Re- Jacob didn't know it, and so when Laban came and uh, checked on uh, Jacob, it says here in Genesis chapter 31. And it says in verse 30, Why do you steal my gods or false idols? Jacob answered in verse 31. Uh, uh, he ran away because he was afraid. And perhaps you take your daughters from me by force. But then he says, now remember he doesn't know it was Rachel who stole the idols. And he pronounced a curse in verse 32. With whomever you find your gods... Do not let him live. In the presence of our brethren, identify what I have of yours, take it with you. Jacob did not know that Rachel had stolen them. Jacob says, whoever has the idols, let that person die. And you know what happened? Just a little while later, when Rachel gave birth, she died. One spoken word. One spoken word release a curse that he himself suffered. In the book of Matthew 12, verse 36, it says that we all humans will give account. I say to you that for every idle word man may speak, they will give account of it in the day of judgment. Do you notice it's not just one word, but it's every idle word? Because my friends, there is power in the spoken word. Now a lot of children, when they are growing from among especially non-Christians who don't know the word, they, some of us have to fight the negative forces that are spoken over your life. And you do not know what it's producing. Now, it's not every word, but there are some times when everything seems to be oriented correctly and everything seems to flow when it's more powerful than other times. Have you noticed it? Sometimes when you exercise faith, we believe God for something, bang, everything flows. Correct. And other times, it doesn't seem to flow. It seems to go up and down before it goes through. Because although we apply every principle, we know you can go to every Bible school you can and learn everything, the principles. Remember, the things we are talking about, we can only understand a small extent. There are forces that are work that are beyond our comprehension. We only know how to position ourselves there, but the rest, it has to work. For example, doctors, you can have the most brilliant doctors, they can operate on you, but in the end, after operating on you, you know what, they have to let your body recover. That's a part they cannot control. There's still an element where they can do their best and minimize the risk, but there's still an element where creation and God has to still work. In the same way, let me just illustrate how that takes place here. And, okay, pretend that this is a little uh, loop here. And uh, I pass it to Stephen. And Stephen, can you just throw... The ball through the loop here. Okay. Oops. Now, he missed it the first time. Let's do it again. Okay. Yep. He got it this time. Right. Second round. He got it through. Now, if this loop is constant and it's a, in, in one place, it remains the same size, and Stephen has more practices, he will be able to get it most of the time. Correct? He got a 50 50 because he got. Uh, out of two times he got once if I were to move the loop further from him aha, his chances would drop from 50-50 to 30% if I were to push it further away for him to get 100% I have to change his name to Robin Hood right. or he may just get 10% correct so as you can see not every time he gets it right through the hook and now Suppose the hoop, besides going further and nearer, let's say this hoop is now movable. 
it goes further and nearer, and it goes side to side. I would say his chances would suddenly drop to 1%. But on top of that, I add the factor that besides it going left and right, up and down, far and near, the hoop also changes in size. It goes small and big. I would say suddenly his chances drop another 10% to 0.1%. Or 0.1% of getting the ball into the hoop. There are things within us that we don't fully understand. Even, even scientists acknowledge they don't understand everything of the human body yet. There are a lot of chemicals that our brain produces of which only about 10% have been classified. You think they understood everything? No, I have a whole book on the human brain. There are a lot of chemicals that are produced that we haven't got any understanding yet. There are a lot of things physically we don't understand. How much less there are things in our soul, in our spirit that we don't understand. So I give you these words here in the book of Hebrews chapter 4, which tells us here what the Word of God works with. In Hebrews chapter 4, it says, For the Word of God is, chapter 4 was sure, For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, and of joints and marrow, is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There's a whole mouthful there. Now, what's all this? What has all this to do? This has all to do with the orientation of our spirit, our soul, and our body into the correct manner for the Word of God to flow right through. And sometimes when you meditate on the Word of God, you believe the Scripture, you confess the Scripture, you visualize you know, with your human imagination, all those things. It is like throwing a ball into a hoop that is moving constantly, that is, that is moving constantly, that is changing in size, because faith and the spirit realm flows through us all the time, correct? But what is the state of your soul? Sometimes you're happy, sometimes you're sad. Sometimes you're, you're, you're full of, uh, of joy. Sometimes you're just uh, quiet and, 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 and depressed. So your soul is up and down. Your spirit is also up and down, growing. Growing in God, but you're growing in grace to grace. And so there are changes that are taking place all the time. And that is why sometimes the word that you spoke from your life seems to have a far-reaching effect. Sometimes the word you speak becomes powerful. At other times you speak and it doesn't seem as powerful. The reverse is also true. Sometimes when God speaks into our life and we are all at different positions, sometimes the word of God that you read goes right through you. And it has a powerful effect on your circumstances. But sometimes it takes a few times before it reaches as I said, that is the unknown factor. But we know what is the unknown factor, but you know what is the known factor. You can still conclude that it has to do with that vision part. Sometimes when the vision is inside. So you see, not all of us know what is within us too. We are only using about 5% of our brain capacity. What's the rest of our brain doing at this very moment? So there are things within us that we don't know. But one thing we know, keep surrounding yourself with the right atmosphere. Let's say Stephen takes a chance and says, well, if my chances have been reduced to 0.1%, let me get 1,000 balls and keep throwing them and, 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 and increase my capacity. Right? The chances of one of those balls getting into the hoop is greater, correct? So that is why the Bible understands our predicament of our fallen human nature and tells us when you lie down, get the word. When you rise up, get the word. When you're walking by the way, get the word. The Bible tells us, surround yourself with the word. Surround yourself with the presence of God. Pray, worship. Why? Because when you surround yourself in all those things, the chances of you hitting an alignment where you release the power of, your, of God in your life is greater and the chances of the God's, God's Spirit speaking into your life is also greater. 
And all it takes is one word to change your whole life. Let me remind you. Just one word to change your life and circumstances. Now, in line with those things, vision and the spoken word that affects the circumstances in our life, you compound it with number three, which is the totality of what everybody else is seeing and everybody else is speaking. In the body of Christ and in society in general. If the word and vision is so powerful, then you go into any community, whatever people are imagining and in their yetsa and speaking is going to gel together and produce a certain inclination. Correct. Sometimes society as a whole has a certain wrong inclination. You can see that in Genesis 6, how all mankind is inclined wrongly. Now, if it's inclined corporately in a wrong direction, it can also be very dangerous. Look at what God says about the Tower of Babel. When all mankind began to incline in the wrong direction, He made these words at the Tower of Babel in Genesis chapter 11. Look at what God says in verse 6. He says, Indeed, the people are one, and they, have, they all have one language, and this is what they began to do. Now, nothing that they purpose to do will be withheld from them. Do you see that? God acknowledges that He has set a law in motion. So that if people have the wrong yetzer and the wrong unity, united over something bad and evil together, they are going to be a force to be reckoned with. Because God has already delegated away all those things to function by themselves as laws unto themselves. And so when men go together, even God says nothing they do can be withheld from them. And God divided them and prevented them from being one heart and one mind. Because He recognized how powerful that is. Now, the opposite is also true. You know the power that is in the book of Acts in the church, it always says, read Acts chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4. You notice this, the church was in one heart and one mind, and you see the words, one accord. Can you see those words? One accord doesn't just be in one place. To be in one place physically, sometimes you can be in one place physically, but your minds are all in different places. And sometimes you can have your heart in different places. You can have different vision. But the Bible tells us, if the church or the people of God could get into one, where everyone sees the same yet, sir, something powerful is going to come forth. And as I said, you cannot bring it down to, to points 1, 2, 3, 4, because there's a mysterious force involved in Hebrews 4, verse 12. I mean, how do you measure bones, marrows, and what's working in spirit, uh, separating your spirit and your soul? All these, you can't measure them. But we can only keep applying them generally, knowing that those general laws will bring you closer to the one accordness of unity of heart and mind for God to release. That is why it's so powerful that Jesus makes statements like Mark chapter 9, verse 23. All things are possible to him who believes. There's the area of believing that's going to release that force. And he says in Matthew chapter 18, where two or three on earth agree as touching anything, it shall be done for them in heaven. But the word agree is the great word symphonio, which means they are like in a symphony together. A symphony speaks of some things vibrating systematically together. Same tone, same, same level, same voice, but that is all in the spiritual realm. Their spirits are vibrating with the same force together. And so there is an element, number three, where society at large is that. That, what happens in the revival? In the revival, the yetza of the whole community has been affected. That is why suddenly it's easier for miracles to take place. Why is it that you could be in Australia, you could preach the gospel, you could preach healing, you could preach uh, the power of God, and you have very little miracles? 
And you take the same message, same preacher, transfer them to a tribe in Africa or some tribal village in India, and you preach the same message and you have great signs and wonders. Because the community Yedza is different. And it takes time to change the community Yedza that is there. Which comes to the last point number four, prayer. The force of prayer is an important key. Because prayer releases a force that can... So remember I told about throwing a ball, and if something has an energy... Let's say if I throw the ball on the floor, it bounces. But if I throw a ball to Stephen, he catches it because he has hands and he, his hands absorb that. So he can throw the ball back. And, uh, so, as he, as he throws the ball, right, the ball doesn't bounce because I catch it. I absorb all its action inside and holds it in my hand. Prayer has that force. No matter what cycles have already been started by the community at large, no matter what cycles, wrong or right, that is out there that is causing circumstances to take place, prayer has the hands of the Spirit involved to absorb every wrong cycle that has been released by the community or things around, it absorbs and it can produce a new cycle into that. Which is why, again I say, it's not like a one, two, three kind of thing. You say, well, if that's so, let's pray for 40 hours and it will be done. You cannot. How do you measure these things? There is, we don't even have a measuring system. One of the first things in science is to get a proper measurement system. If they don't have a meter measurement or, 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 or ohms, or, or they have to invent new measurement, gravity, measure in newtons. They have new measuring system to measure forces. We don't even have a measuring system for the spiritual forces. But one thing we know, we keep doing an abundance of what is right, and that begins to affect. Now, God, understanding that all circumstances work that way, Remember we talk about God speaking in circumstances. God knowing all this background, all these words, visions, and all the community yet, sir, and, uh, and the prayers of God saints that go forth, that affect and change circumstances right now. Right now, what is to happen tomorrow? One week from now, one month from now, one year from now, is already being created in the spiritual realm. All the forces that are to be released over the next one month, two months, are already there. Now, if in the present we begin to change, it will begin to change the future too. Right now. Because we could be in the midst of some cycles not completed yet. Whether of evil or of good. But we pray, more good will result. And that is where, when God begins to work in your life, and you understand these forces... How does God speak through our circumstances and changes? He begins, number one, to put new yetzer and visions into you and I. So when God wants to change the future, He gives visions. Isn't it interesting? It says, when the Holy Spirit comes on all flesh, young men shall see visions, old men shall dream dreams. Handmaidens of prophesy, visions and dreams. So my friends, the dreams that you've been having, the visions that you're having, the flashes of visions that you're having, are for the purpose of being grafted into your spirit man in some way through constant impartation to change the future. Because when all, imagine if God began to cause us all to see something in the spirit that is common, is going to affect the total yet of the community. Now, the power that is in the body of Christ is so much greater, where it's a thousand times greater. Where it takes one Christian to have the right yet to cancel off a thousand people who have the wrong yet who do not know him. One will chase a thousand, two chase ten thousand. It's a thousand fold effect. So we don't need too many to be a majority to affect the community. We just need to see the visions of God. And that is where the second point comes in. When you begin to see it, guess what? You begin to speak about it. You begin to speak about it. 
And that is where Philippians chapter 2 takes place. In Philippians chapter 2, it says here, in verse 12 and 13, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to do for His good pleasure. Do you notice the words there? It is God who works in us to will. Before you even do it, God was causing you to desire it. God was causing you to desire it. And that desire, that's why desire is an important component to faith. Whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive. Now God begins to work in our desires. He causes you to will, not just to do. Can you imagine that? We can understand what is behind our actions. Our Mind or subconscious or reflex action is an action. But can you understand what is behind your will? What is causing you to choose? Causing you to be willing? The Spirit of God. Working on the behind, putting the desires in our heart. And that is where He propels us forward. Even as we clumsily seek to follow in the flow of the Spirit. He is behind causing our willingness to flow in a certain direction. Our desire and then it will be a burning uh, sense of community. Have you noticed that when you are together with the body of Christ, you begin to have certain desires for the Lord that you may never have when you're alone. That is the Spirit of God working. And I like this man of God uh, who, who illustrates how Jesus was about to come. He talks about how God's Spirit works in the body of Christ and suddenly there's a hunger and desire for Jesus to come so great that it causes you know, all the circumstances and everything to flow and then Jesus shows forth and comes forth. That desire. Charles S. Price, one of those first healers in God, talks about how before you have you, you, you one foot you need a desire for food. And before you fly, you have wings. And how God began to put His desires in our life in order to mold and flow our circumstances for what is to come. And that is where you find David in the right place, at the right time, doing the right thing, because when he found that he had done the wrong thing, now, when he was motivated by the wrong thing, it must be some unknown darkness in his life. Pride that came out. And due to pride, he fell aside to the bed, and the Spirit of God caused a desire to repent. He flowed with the desire, and he wanted to go right to where it was happening. Right? Something must have moved him there. His desire to seek God. What was he doing out of the field? He could have remained in his house, correct? He didn't have to go out to the field. But because of this desire, of this great desire to seek God, this great repentance and, and, and sorrow that he felt, he went right out to the field to where the plague was. Because he was guilty and he says, it should happen to me and not to everyone else. So that drove him to the right place at the right time and bang! When God answered, he was at the right place at the right time. No matter what has happened in your life, there is a way to turn and stop the circumstances. Now right now where you are sitting, there are some things that are already released good and bad. That may be about to happen. 
Some things are unknown darkness or yet, sir. But the good news is, I'll end with Romans chapter 8, verse 28. All things work together for good to those who love God and who are called to the purpose of God. Two conditions. You love God, and what they say? All things. All things means all circumstances, correct? It has to be all circumstances. And so, how does God speak in circumstances? When God speaks in creation, as I say, you need a revelation. How does God speak through circumstances? When circumstances occur, listen to what is happening in your heart. What are the desires that the Spirit quicken into your life? Because the quickening of those desires, it is not in a real voice. Desire is not really a voice that has an alphabet and form words, correct? Desire is something deep within us, more like our intuition. And it's like God working deep within us to propel us, to compel us into a certain direction. So that when you look back, you realize even God uses all those things. All things work for good. No matter good or bad, if you begin to love God and you begin to seek His will. Even the worst times. When Elijah was running away because of his fear of Queen Jezebel. But yet, he sought God. And when he sought God, the angels fed him and and he, he went on. And the Bible tells us after that, he continued to be a prophet and he anointed Elisha to replace him. More things took place. Because there was a desire that drove him towards God. How does God speak through our circumstances? By giving you flashes of visions of things to come. What it can be. Hoping that one, 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 one of them will get into your spirit. Of the abundance that He gives to you. And the desires that He produces in your life. Because when circumstances cause you to react correctly, when you react correctly, it could be the end of the bad and the beginning of the new. But if you react wrongly, it could be a continuation of the bad. Because you produce a new cycle. So no matter what circumstances are, good or bad, you always start in the realm of prayer and asking God to desire. God to pr- produce the willingness in you to do that which He desire you to do. Let's pray. Father, we ask, Lord, that Your Spirit will work in our hearts and in our life. Lord, that You cause that inkling, the desire... The Holy Spirit is now searching our hearts and our life. He says, when you saw tragedy took place, what were your feelings? What were your desires? Do you desire to pray, but did you pray? Do you desire to weep, but did you weep? Do you desire to flow into something closer to God, but did you follow along or you let things just pass? Or when circumstances happen in your life, when events happen that could be striking, or things took place around you, home, friends, families, what did it do to you? Did it pull you away or did it draw you closer? Listen to your heart. Because sometimes the Lord knows It takes a great amount of the angels causing the circumstances to flow in a certain way to produce those tears to flow. Those desires to be uttered. Yea, my children, save the Lord. For those who are hardened, I will cause hard circumstances that they will be softened. 
For those who are soft, I will cause gentle circumstances and some stretching circumstances that they may be toughened. For I know all things in your life, saith the Lord. I know every circumstances and even in your life. Yea, I know every tear you, you weep. I know every heartbreak you experience. I know every sorrow. For have I not walked in your midst and lived in your midst, saith the Lord. I know, saith the Lord, that because you love me, I will never let you go. And I will always be with you. And I will always lead you. For sometimes, saith the Lord, it is hard to speak to you. For you will not hear, you will not hearken. And I have to allow circumstances to speak to you. But if you will respond to the circumstances, they are turning your life around. And you will cause them to draw from you the richest spiritual heritage you have. And the spiritual strength that you did not know that you have. And the earnestness or desire for me that you did not know you have. Then I will cause all things to work for good to those who love me. For no self the Lord that there is only one thing that I would allow upon your lives. And that is all circumstances will lead you to love me more than you have ever loved me. But there are many, when these circumstances happen, that allow the enemy to make their love cold. But if you will love me through circumstances, I will cause an outpouring of blessings that I has not seen nor ear heard, nor has entered into the heart of man the things which I prepared for them. I have prepared blessings, saith the Lord. Great blessings and abundance for those who love me. We thank you, Father, for your words. Father, we thank you, Lord, that you're drawing our love out to you. Through tough times, through lean times, the one thing you desire is for us to love you. And when we love you with an undivided heart, we know, Lord, there are great things you have in store. Great things that you are inscribing upon our life. We thank you, Father. We bless you, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Let's all rise.